Hi guys. So we're going to be going over chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, and we're going to be going over the entire labor process care during labor and delivery, assisted delivery, and C-section pain management. So as a nurse, it's pretty essential for you to understand the components of labor, how these components work together in the process of labor, and how the woman and fetus adapt to labor in normal situations. Now, this allows you to support the laboring woman appropriately and assist her through a safe labor and delivery. And all these chapters explore each component of labor and birth separately and then discuss the combined components during the process of labor. So we'll be going over the four essential components of the labor process, how they work together to accomplish birth. We're gonna discuss the current theories regarding causes of labor onset. We're going to list anticipatory signs of labor differentiate between false labor and true labor, outline the seven mechanisms or cardinal movements of a spontaneous vaginal delivery, identify the stages and phases of labor and events that occur in each stage or phase, discuss the ways the woman physiologically and psychologically adapts to labor, and describe the fetal physiological responses to labor. So, Let's talk about the four essential components of labor. These are known as the four P's of labor, which is a pretty easy mnemonic to remember for the labor process. Now, we have the passageway, which is the maternal pelvis and soft tissues. We have the passenger, which is known as the fetus. We have powers, which is involuntary and voluntary muscle contractions. And then we have the psyche, which is the psychological state of the woman. Now, any of these areas individually, if they have problems, it completely negatively impacts the entire labor process. So the passageway consists of the woman's bony pelvis and soft tissues of the cervix and vagina. Now the bony pelvis has a false pelvis and a true pelvis. So as you can see in the upper picture, the pink part of that pelvis, that's known as the false pelvis. And that's the flared upper portion of the bony pelvis. But this is not considered to be part of the bony passageway. Now, the true pelvis is that blue circle that you see in the area on the picture on the top right. This is the portion of the pelvis below the linea terminalis. Now, the blue part, that true pelvis, it consists of the inlet, mid pelvis, and outlet. Now, since the true pelvis is the area that the fetus has to be delivered vaginally. If there's any change to the dimension and the shape of that pelvis may determine whether or not the fetus may be delivered vaginally or if we have to go the different cesarean route. So as you can see in the bottom picture, the purple line and the blue line, that area in between those two lines is the area that the fetus will be delivered. That's why it's called the true pelvis and that's the bony passageway that the fetus has to be delivered through. So we have four different pelvic types. Now the shape of the inlet determines the pelvic type. So the four basic pelvic shapes are gynecoid, anthropoid, android, and platypoloid. Now Women have pelvises that are all various combinations of these four types. So the gynecoid pelvis is actually the most favorable for a vaginal birth. And as you can see on the right-hand side picture, that orange section is the gynecoid pelvis. Now, as you can see for the inlet, it's pretty wide all the way throughout, which is pretty favorable for a fetus to be delivered through. Now, again, it's considered the typical female pelvis, although only about half of all women have a gynecoid pelvis. Next, we have the android pelvis, which is the blue section. Now, as you can see, it's pretty heart-shaped. Um, this is actually the typical male pelvis, and approximately a third of white women and 16% of non-white women have an android pelvis. So large babies will often become stuck in the birth canal and have to be delivered by cesarean, whereas a smaller baby may be able to navigate through that heart shape. Next, we have anthropoid, which is that green section right there. Now, it's elongated in its dimensions. So you can see that it's kind of wider up at the top, right? Almost as wide as the gynecoid. But the problem is at the very end, 
it does the heart shape. It's, it's that cone shape right there. So it's very long, but it's not quite as wide. So a vaginal birth can be accomplished in approximately about a third of women who have variations of this kind of pelvis, but it's not quite as easy as a gynecoid pelvis. The last one is a platypaloid pelvis, and this is the least common type. So as you can see, it's very flat. So it may be wide, but it's not very long. So this makes it very, very hard for a vaginal delivery. It makes it hard for the fetus to pass through the bony pelvis. So usually those women with platypaloid pelvises will deliver the fetus by cesarean section. So regarding pelvic dimensions, early in the pregnancy, particularly if a woman has never delivered a baby vaginally, the doctor will take pelvic measurements to estimate the size of the true pelvis. Now, this will determine if the size is adequate for vaginal delivery. However, these measurements do not consistently predict which women will have difficulty delivering vaginally. So, healthcare providers will allow the woman to attempt to labor and attempt a vaginal birth before going to a cesarean section. Now, we need to keep in mind that you cannot determine the shape and dimensions of the pelvic inlet by the size of a woman. So just because a woman is very, very small doesn't mean that she has a very small elongated pelvis. She could have a very roomy gynecoid pelvis, whereas a larger woman may have a small contracted platypaloid or android pelvis. So the most important measurement of the pelvic inlet is the obstetric conjugate and that's the smallest diameter through which the fetus must pass. Uh, it's a measurement that takes into account the diagonal conjugate, which is the distance from the symphysis pubis to the sacral plumometry. However, the obstetric conjugate cannot be measured directly. Therefore, the doctor has to estimate the size. So an adequate measurement is about 11 centimeters to accommodate a vaginal delivery. So the soft tissues are the so the cervix and vagina are soft tissues that form the part of the passageway known as the birth canal. So in early pregnancy, the cervix is firm, long, and closed, and measures approximately two centimeters in length. As the time of delivery approaches, the cervix usually begins to soften. When labor begins, uterine contractions change the cervix in two different ways. First, the cervix begins to get shorter and thinner, and this is called effacement. Cervical effacement is recorded as a percentage. At a length of one centimeter, the cervix is 50% effaced. When the cervix is completely effaced, it is paper thin and it is called 100% effaced. So the second change that occurs during normal labor is dilation. So the cervix must allow the cervix must open to allow the fetus to be born. Dilation is measured in centimeters, and when the cervix is dilated completely, it measures at 10 centimeters. Normally, a primiparous woman experiences effacement before dilation. For a multiparous woman, which means multiple births, both processes usually occur at the same time. Often, the multiparous cervix dilates 1 to 2 centimeters several weeks before labor begins. So as you can see in the picture, it illustrates the processes of cervical effacement and dilation as they normally occur for the primipara, which means no birth. This is their first birth. So the way the vaginal canal participates in childbirth is via passive distension. So during birth, the rugae of the vaginal walls, which is kind of like the rigid edges of the wall, will stretch and smooth out along allowing for considerable expansion. Now, the muscles and soft tissues of the primipara, which is a woman that's giving birth for the first time, provide greater resistance to stretching and distending than do those of women who have given birth multiple times. This is one reason the first baby often takes longer to be born than the subsequent babies. State whether the following statement is true or false. 
the gynecoid pelvis is the most favorable for a vaginal birth. It's true, right? We said that this is the most favorable for a vaginal birth because it's wide all the way throughout. So the passenger refers to the fetus. Now, the size of the fetal skull and the way the fetus is situated, this means how the fetus is lying, how they're presented, their position, this significantly affects the labor process. So the fetal skull is the most important fetal structure in relation to labor and birth because it is, it is the largest and least compressible structure. So the diameters of the fetal skull have to be small enough to allow the head to travel through the bony pelvis. Fortunately, the fetal skull is not entirely rigid so the cartilage between the bones allows the bones to overlap during labor, and this is called molding, which allows the fetal skull to elongate, thereby reducing the diameter of the head. So the newborn of a primipara, which is a woman who hasn't given birth, this is her first birth, often has significant molding. As you can see in the picture, the top picture to the right hand side. So minutes after birth, it's elongated because the skull is essentially molding itself to be able to fit through the vaginal canal. But eventually that starts to go away and they start to get the normal head shape back. So how the fetus lies. So fetal lie describes the position of the long axis of the fetus in relation to the long axis of the pregnant woman. There are three basic ways that the fetus can lie in the uterus. Uh, in a longitudinal, transverse, or oblique position. So the most common position is the longitudinal lie. This means that there's the spine of the fetus is parallel to the spine of the mother, which means their back is facing the mother's back. Where the if you're looking towards the mom, the fetus's face is actually facing towards you and their spine is parallel with the mother's. When the fetus is in a transverse lie, the long axis of the fetus is perpendicular to that of a woman. So it, it's actually as if the baby is lying, as if the baby is lying perpendicularly. So if you look in your book in figure 8-5, you can see that the baby's head is actually laying on the left side of the mom's pelvis. So it's almost as if the head is laying on a woman's hip versus the head being up top or more uh, downwards uh, near the, ver uh, the birth canal. An oblique lie is in between a longitudinal and a transverse lie. So essentially what you guys need to know is that the best position for a fetus to be delivered vaginally is a longitudinal lie, which means their head needs to be right where the birth canal starts. Any other way that the fetus lies starts to negatively impact the delivery process. So let's talk about fetal presentation. This refers to the foremost part of the fetus that enters the pelvic inlet. Now there are three main ways the fetus can present to the pelvis the head, the feet, or the buttocks. Now, the head, if the fetus presents uh, to the pelvis with their head, this is called cephalic presentation. Now, if their feet or their buttocks present to the pelvis, this is called breech presentation. And if their shoulder presents to the pelvis, then it's called shoulder presentation. So the cephalic presentation is the most common presentation. Breach presentations occur in approximately 3% of term pregnancies. Shoulder presentation is associated with a transverse lie. So as you can see in this picture at the bottom, the very right hand side one where the infant is perpendicular almost, this is the most common situation for shoulder presentation. Fetal attitude refers to the relationship of the fetal parts to one another. In a cephalic presentation, there are several different ways the head can present to the maternal true pelvis. Now, the most common attitude and the one that's most favorable for a vaginal birth 
is an attitude of flexion, also called a vertex presentation. When the fetus curls up into an ovoid shape, he or she presents the smallest diameters of the skull to the true pelvis. Now, when the fetus is neither flexed nor hyperextended, he or she is in a military presentation and a larger head diameter is presented to the true pelvis. If the fetus's neck is partially extended, the brow, called the frontum, becomes the presenting part. If the neck if the fetus's neck is fully extended, the face presents to the true pelvis. Now, as you can see in the picture to the right-hand side, you can tell the difference in the different attitudes. So there's the face and then the brow and breech and shoulder, which gives a little bit more of a visual presentation as to how these are done. So the doctor can determine fetal position by first establishing the presenting part. So if it's occiput or brow, um, the doctor then determines if the part is facing the maternal right or the left hand side and also which direction it's facing in relation to the maternal pelvis. So the fetal position is documented in the clinical record using abbreviations. Now the first letter describes the side of the maternal pelvis towards which the presenting part is facing. So R for right and L for left. The second letter of the abbreviation indicates the fetal presenting part. O for occiput, FR for frontum, etc. So the last letter of the abbreviation specifies whether the presenting part is facing the anterior or the posterior of the maternal pelvis or whether it is in a transverse position. For instance, the occipital bone or occiput is the presenting part in a vertex presentation. If the occiput is facing the right anterior quadrant of the pelvis, the position is recorded as right occiput anterior, ROA. If you would like to refer to your book in chapter 8, figure 8-8 eight eight illustrates examples of different positions in a vertex presentation and how the positions would be documented. The most favorable positions for vaginal birth are occiput anterior, either ROA or LOA. So usually if a fetus is in a vertex position, they are, they have occiput fetal presenting part. If they are in a brow position, they have frontum presenting part. If they are in a face position, they are in a mentum, which is the chin fetal presenting part. If they're in breech position, that means that their sacrum is the fetal presenting part. And if they're in a shoulder position, then their scapula is the fetal presenting part. So the doctor will document fetal position as an abbreviation using the following criteria. So the first designation refers to the maternal, the side of the maternal pelvis in which the presenting part is found, which is the right or the left. And then the second middle designation refers to the presenting part. So is it their occiput, their frontum, their mentum, their sacrum, or their scapula? And then the last third designation refers to the front, back, or side of the maternal pelvis in which the reference point is found. The fetal station refers to the relationship of the presenting part of the fetus to the ischial spines of the pelvis. When the widest diameter of the presenting part is at the level of the ischial spines, the station is zero. If the presenting part is above the level of the ischial spines, the station is, is recorded as a negative number and is read minus. If the presenting part is below the level of the ischial spines, the station is recorded as a positive number and is read plus. For example, in a cephalic presentation, if the widest part of the fetal head is one centimeter above the level of the ischial spines, the station is reported as a minus one and recorded as minus one. If on the other hand, the presenting part is one centimeter below the level of the ischial spines, the station is recorded as a plus one and recorded as plus one. When the station is a minus four or higher, the fetus is said to be floating and unengaged. When the fetus is floating, the presenting part has not yet entered the true pelvis. When the presenting part has settled into the true pelvis at the level of the ischial spines, 
the fetus is said to be engaged and reported to be at a station of zero. The primary force of labor comes from involuntary muscular contractions of the uterus. These labor contractions cause effacement and dilation of the cervix during the first stage of labor. Secondary powers are voluntary muscle contractions of the maternal abdomen during the second stage of labor that helps expel the fetus. So each uterine contraction is composed of three phases, increment, acne, and decrement, followed by a relaxation period. The increment or building up of the contraction is the longest phase. During the increment, the contraction gains strength until it reaches the acne or the peak of the contraction. The decrement is the letting up phase as the uterus relaxes gradually to baseline. So as you can see in this picture at the bottom, that's the waves of contractions that a woman during labor goes through. Now, contractions are documented using three descriptors, frequency, duration, and intensity. Frequency refers to how often the tra contractions are occurring and is measured by counting the time interval from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the following contraction. Duration is the interval from the beginning of a contraction to its end, and intensity refers to the strength of a contraction. Intensity is recorded as mild, moderate, or strong, and can be estimated by palpating the fundus at the peak of its contraction. Intensity can also be measured directly with an intrauterine pressure transducer. Please keep in mind that because each contraction interrupts blood flow to the placenta temporarily, there is a decreased oxygen available to the fetus. It is as, as if the fetus must hold his or her breath during each contraction. Therefore, the fetus cannot tolerate contractions that last too long. The fetal attitude refers to the relationship of fetal parts to each other. Which fetal attitude is most favorable to a vaginal birth? As we discussed, the flexion, which is also known as a vertex presentation, presentation is the most favorable for a vaginal birth. So labor is categorized into four stages. The first stage is divided further into three phases. So each stage and phase of labor has unique characteristics that help the nurse and the doctor determine if labor is progressing exactly as expected. It's important to know that individual labor is very greatly with regard to length. Many factors affect the progress of labor, such as parity, the use of agents to soften the cervix, labor induction techniques, and the type of anesthesia, if any, was used. So the first stage is dilation. Now, the first stage of labor begins with the onset of true labor and ends with the full dilation of the cervix at 10 centimeters. This stage is subdivided into three phases, which is latent, active, and transition. 
Now, early labor, which is considered to be the latent phase, begins when the contractions of true labor start and ends when the cervix is dilated at four centimeters. Contractions during this phase are of mild intensity and typically occur at a frequency of about five to 10 minutes with a duration of about 30 to 45 seconds. In normal labor, the pattern of contractions during the latent phase become increasingly regular with shorter intervals between contractions. This latent phase, which is early labor, lasts on average approximately eight to nine hours for a woman that has not had any children, but generally doesn't exceed 20 hours in length. Now, women who have had multiple births usually experience shorter labors at an average about five hours with an upper limit to about 14. So the second part of the first stage is active labor. Active labor begins at four centimeters cervical dilation and ends when the cervix is dilated at eight centimeters. Contractions typically occur about two to five minutes and last anywhere from 45 to 60 seconds, and they're about moderate to strong intensity. Progressive cervical dilation and fetal descent normally occur in this phase. You'll find that in this phase, conversations tend to be more limited when talking with a woman who is in labor because she's focused on her contractions and she generally rests with her eyes closed between contractions and she may or may not be diaphoretic. So the last stage in dilation is the transition phase. Cervical dilation is anywhere from about eight centimeters to 10 centimeters, which is complete dilation. And it occurs about every two to three minutes uh, with 60 to 90 seconds in between. Now these contractions are very strong. This is the most difficult phase for women and women must resist if she has a strong urge to push. You'll find that a woman that is in this phase of labor may be nauseous, she might be vomiting, she might be irritable, diaphoretic, inability to relax, and generally has a feeling of a loss of control. We have to remind the woman that's in labor that it is important for her to resist the urge to push until the cervix is dilated completely because if you push against a partially dilated cervix, it can cause swelling, which slows labor or the cervix can develop lacerations, which end up leading to hemorrhage. The second stage is birth. The second stage begins when the cervix is dilated fully to 10 centimeters and ends with the birth of an infant. Contractions usually continue at a frequency of about every two to three minutes, lasting 60 to 90 seconds, and they're usually of strong intensity. The average length of the second stage is about one hour for preemie paras and 20 minutes for multi paras. Although it's normal for a preemie para to be in the stage for about two hours or longer. Now during the stage, the woman is encouraged to use her abdominal muscles to bear down during contractions while the fetus continues to descend and rotate to the anterior position. Fetal descent is usually slow, but steady for the preemie para from the active phase of the first stage through the second stage. Frequently, the fetus of a multipara may not descend significantly during active labor, but may rapidly descend during the second stage. In this scenario, the baby may be born with one or two pushes. When the fetus is at a station of plus four, he or she proceeds to move through the cardinal movements of extension and external rotation, followed by the delivery of the shoulders and expulsion of the rest of the body. In the, in the third stage is the delivery of the placenta. Now, this begins with the birth of the baby and ends with the delivery of the placenta. This can last anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes for both preemie paras and multi paras. Signs that indicate the placenta is separating from the uterine wall include a gush of blood, lengthening of the umbilical cord, and a globular shape to the fundus. The placenta usually delivers spontaneously by one of two mechanisms, expulsion by Schultz mechanism, which means that the fetal or shiny side of the placenta delivers first, and then delivery by Duncan mechanism specifies that the maternal or rough side of the placenta presents first. The last stage is the fourth stage, recovery. Because of the tremendous stages that the new mother's body goes through during the process of labor and delivery, the period of recovery after delivery of the placenta is considered to be the fourth stage of labor. This can last anywhere from one to four hours, 
and during this stage, observe the woman frequently for signs of hemorrhage or other complications. It's pretty easy to confuse phases of the first stage of labor with the stages of labor in the second, third, and fourth. So be able to clearly define each stage and phase so that you don't confuse the phases with stages during an examination. There are some clues as to the nearness of labor. So about two weeks or so before labor, engagement can occur, which causes the pregnant woman to sense that the baby has quote unquote dropped. So sub this subjective feeling is called lightning. The woman's able to breathe a little bit more easily. She may need to urinate a little bit more frequently because of the pressure of the fetus on the urinary bladder. Now, not all women experience lightning before the onset of labor, and multi-pairs women often do not experience lightning until labor begins. So Braxton Hicks contractions can occur more frequently and are more noticeable as the pregnancy approaches term. These irregular contractions usually decrease in intensity with walking and position changes. These contractions are not part of labor and don't cause effacement or dilation to occur. The woman may experience GI disturbances such as di diarrhea, heartburn, nausea, vomiting as labor approaches. Sometimes the mucus plug is expelled a week or two before labor begins. Now, when the mucus plug passes, the woman will notice a one-time clear or pink tinged discharge that is the consistency of jelly. Frequently, the woman experiences a burst of energy 24 to 48 hours before the onset of labor. She may have the energy and desire to do thorough cleaning or some other big project in anticipation of the baby's arrival, no, a, pho a phenomenon known as the nesting urge. Caution the woman regarding the nesting urge and advise her to conserve her energy for the work of labor. Clinical signs that labor is approaching include ripening or the softening and effacement, the thinning of the cervix. Dilation of the cervix may accompany ripening and effacement, particularly in multiparous women. The doctor informs the woman that these changes if a pelvic examination is done during a scheduled office visit. So let's talk about true labor and false labor. So false labor refers to the increase in Braxton Hicks contractions that occur toward the end of a pregnancy. These practice contractions can be pretty uncomfortable, which make it difficult to distinguish true labor from false labor. So in true labor, there is progressive dilation and effacement for the cervix. But in false labor, there's not. There's none. Now, in the bloody show, for true labor, it's present. But for false labor, there is not. It may be a pinkish mucus or the woman may expel the mucus plug. Contractions in true labor may be regular. They might be irregular at first, but generally they're regular in pattern and they develop in which contractions become increasingly intense and more frequent. Whereas in false labor, the pattern for contractions tends to be irregular, although the contractions may seem to have a regular pattern for a time. You'll find that in true labor, there's no significant change in fetal movement, even though the fetus continues to move. Whereas in false labor, the fetal movement may intensify for a short period or it may remain the same. Now, you can also, there's also an effect on walking. So if you walk during true labor, the contractions continue and become stronger. Whereas if you walk for a significant amount of time, so like 30 minutes to an hour, and you walk during false labor, they may actually decrease the frequency or eliminate the contractions altogether. So what you'll find is that somebody that's pregnant may go to the doctor thinking that she's in labor and the doctor will let her know whether or not she is dilated or her face and he'll let her know, why don't you go walking for about an hour or so and then come back? When they come back, if they are dilated, then they stay. Now, if they are not dilated, even after that walking and the 
contractions go away, then that person is instructed to go home. So for a vaginal birth to occur, the fetus has to pass through the birth canal. The turns and movements made during birth are referred to as cardinal movements or of delivery. These seven movements are engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, external rotation, and expulsion. And although the movements are discussed separately, it's important for you to understand that they may overlap or occur simultaneously. So engagement is the initial descent of the fetal head that results in engagement when the presenting part descends to the level of the ischial spine. Engagement may occur as early as two weeks before labor or not until after the onset of labor. Engagement is more likely to occur earlier in the primigravida and later in the multigravida. Descent may begin before labor when the fetus drops. Descent is measured by station, which is the relationship of the fetal presenting part to the maternal ischial spine. Descent continues throughout labor until the fetus reaches the fetal station of plus four. Flexion is when, as the head descends during labor, the fetus encounters resistance from the soft tissues and muscles of the pelvic floor. This resistance normally coaxes the fetus to assume an attitude of flexion. Flexion is the attitude that presents the smallest diameters of the fetal head to the dimensions of the pelvis. Internal rotation. Frequently in early labor, the fetal head presents to the pelvis in a transverse position because the inlet of the pelvis is the widest from side to side. During active labor, the fetal head typically rotates 45 degrees from a transverse position to an anterior position so that the head can accommodate the pelvic outlet, which is wider from front to back. This movement is called internal rotation. If the fetus doesn't rotate, the widest diameters of the fetal head present to the outlet of the pelvis, resulting in a less than optimal fit between the head and the bony passageway. This can prolong labor. Extension, typically the fetal head is well flexed with the chin on the chest as the fetus travels through the birth canal. When the fetus reaches the pubic arch, it must extend under the symphysis pubis. External rotation, as the head is born, external rotation lines the head up with the shoulders. Expulsion, expulsion birth occurs after delivery of the anterior and posterior shoulders. Which stage of labor is birth? First stage, second stage, third stage, or fourth stage? So as we discussed, the second stage is birth. The second stage begins when the cervix is dilated fully to 10 centimeters and ends with the birth of the infant. Labor is pretty intense for the mother. Physically, it's almost as if we're putting the mother through a very vigorous exercise. She needs an increased demand for oxygen. Her pulse will go up. Her cardiac output increases. She attributes a large part of her energy for uterine contractions. Um, her respiratory rate increases. Labor can also prolong the normal gastric emptying time. Uh, this can also lead to the mother being nauseous and uh, she might vomit during active labor. Uh, it increases the mother's risk for aspiration, particularly if general anesthesia is required. Pressure on the urethra from presenting part may also cause the bladder to overfill and a decreased sensation to void and also edema. A full bladder is uncomfortable and generally slows the pro progression of labor. We also have to think that labor Labor is hard work, and it generally puts a demand on a woman's coping resources. The woman's response changes as the labor progresses. During early labor, the woman is usually excited and talkative, although anxiety and apprehension can also be common responses. 
Now, as the labor becomes more active, the woman becomes a little bit more introverted and focuses her energies on coping with the stress of contractions. Women who are unprepared psychologically for labor lose control easily during the active phase and may resort to crying, screaming, or thrashing during contractions. This may impede the labor process by muscular tension. Transition being the most intense phase of the first stage of labor are where women have had natural birth classes have a difficult time maintaining positive coping strategies during this phase of labor. Usually they need support, encouragement, and positive reinforcement being that they feel out of control in this phase. Now for fetal adaptation to labor, normal labor stresses the fetus in several ways. Uh, intracranial pressure will increase as the fetal head meets resistance from the birth canal. Sometimes this increased pressure results in a slowing of the fetal heart rate at the peak of a contraction and a normal phenomenon. Placental blood flow, the source of oxygen for the fetus, is temporarily interrupted at the peak of each contraction. Pushing efforts interrupt placental blood flow for even longer periods, and because of these, even the healthy fetus experiences a slowly decreasing pH throughout labor. Although labor stresses the fetal cardiovascular system, a healthy fetus is able to compensate and maintain the heart rate within normal limits. The act of passing through the birth canal is beneficial to the fetus in two ways. The process of labor stimulates surfactant production to promote respiratory adaptation at birth. Also, as the fetus descends, maternal tissues compress the fetus's body a process that helps clear the respiratory passageway of mucus. Infants who are born by C-section usually require more frequent suctioning because they have not had the benefit of this compression. Pressure on the fetus caused by progress through the birth canal may result in areas of ecchymosis or edema, particularly on the presenting part. Our role during the admission of a woman that is going into labor would to be obtain immediate data collection, observing for signs that birth is imminent. So if through obstetric, medical, surgical, and social history, if the birth is not imminent, we may not need to admit them. We determine their labor status, the woman's labor and birth preferences. Uh, we're going to determine fetal status, risk factors, determine their maternal status, and monitor maternal and fetal status and labor progress. Mrs. Jones, a Gravida 4, Para 3, has just come into labor and delivery suite. She tells the admission nurse that her water broke two hours ago and she feels like pushing. What is the first assessment the nurse should make? So it would be B, the imminence of birth. Now, the nursing assessment for signs that birth is imminent begins from the moment the woman arrives in labor and delivery unit. If the woman is introverted and stops to breathe or pant with each contraction, you can infer that she's in an advanced stage of labor. In addition, if the woman makes statements such as, I feel a lot of pressure, or the baby is coming, or I want to have a bowel movement, it's likely that the woman is in the second stage of labor and that the baby will be born soon. The contraction pattern can be evaluated using electronic external or internal methods or by palpation. Not all laboring women are on continuous electric fetal monitoring. Continuous electric fetal monitoring has not been shown to decrease mortality rates but may increase the rate of invasive procedures during labor. If intermittent assessment techniques are used, use palpation to evaluate and time the contraction pattern. Now when you use an EFM, which is an electronic fetal monitoring, a topodynanometer measures contraction frequency and duration. As the uterus contracts, the sensor sends a signal to the monitor and prints out a graph of the contraction. The FHR is recorded on the same printout. In this way, the healthcare provider can monitor the FHR, the fetal heart rate, pattern in conjunction with the uterine contraction pattern. Contraction frequency and duration are determined by palpation 
or by evaluating the electronic fetal monitoring tracing. However, unless the woman has an internal uterine pressure catheter, you must palpate the contractions to evaluate intensity. The height of the contraction is an estimate of its intensity. However, many factors affect the height of the contraction on an external tracing. For example, a small woman with minimal adipose tissue may be having mild contractions, but on the monitor strip, the contractions appear tall and pronounced. On the other hand, an obese woman may be having strong contractions that barely register on the tracing. For these reasons, palpation is the most accurate way to estimate intensity when using external monitoring. If the fundus feels like the tip of your nose at the peak of a contraction, that contraction is mild. If the fundus feels firmer, as when you touch your chin, the contraction is of moderate intensity. A fundus that cannot be indented at all, one that feels like you're pushing on your forehead, is indicative of a strong contraction. Another method of monitoring contractions is the internal method, during which an intrauterine pressure catheter is used. The trained birth attendant places the catheter tip above the presenting part in a pocket of amniotic fluid and then connects the catheter to the fetal monitor. In addition to recording the frequency and duration of contractions, the internal catheter accurately describes and measures the intensity of uterine activity. This information is particularly useful when the woman is undergoing labor after a previous cesarean delivery or when she is receiving an oxytocin infusion to induce labor. So the LVN is expected not to make a final decision about the fetal heart rate pattern, but we must be able to recognize reassuring and non-reassuring signs in order to get help when indicated. When interpreting a fetal monitor tracing, the first element is to evaluate is the baseline fetal heart rate. The baseline rate is measured between uterine contractions during a 10 minute period. The normally accepted baseline rate is between 110 and 160 beats per minute. Another element to evaluate is the baseline variability, fluctuations of the uh, fetal heart rate from the baseline rate. Variability is a normal if the fluctuations are greater than six beats per minute and less than 25 beats per minute. The presence of moderate variability is a reassuring sign that the fetus is well oxygenated. Now, there are three major deviations from a normal fetal heart rate baseline, tachycardia, bradycardia, and absent or minimal variability. Fetal tachycardia is a, gr is a rate greater than 160 beats per minute, and a fetal heart rate below 110 beats per minute is fetal bradycardia. The abnormal rate must continue for at least two minutes for identification of tachycardia or bradycardia. The absence of variability is also a non-reassuring sign. Sometimes there's a slowing of the fetal heart rate. If the dip in the fetal heart rate tracing occurs in conjunction with and mirrors a uterine contraction, it's called an early deceleration. This type of deceleration looks like a U on the fetal monitor tracing like that of an upside down contraction. Three criteria classify the deceleration as early. One, the fetal heart rate begins to slow as the contraction starts. Two, the lowest point of the deceleration, the nadir, coincides with the acne, the highest point of the contraction. And three, the deceleration ends by the end of the contraction. Current scientific evidence indicates that the early decelerations are caused by pressure on the fetal head as it meets resistance from the structures of the birth canal. The contraction pushes the fetal head downward, causing pressure, which in turn leads to a slowing of the fetal heart rate. As long as the baseline remains within normal limits and the variability is good, early decelerations are benign. Therefore, no specific nursing intervention is indicated other than to continue to monitor the tracing and observe closely for the development of non-reassuring patterns. A variable deceleration may occur at any point during a contraction and it has a jagged erratic shape on the fetal monitor tracing. The fetal heart rate suddenly drops from the baseline and then recovers. A variable deceleration is variable in timing and in shape and may resemble a U, a V, or a W. 
The presence of variable decelerations indicates some type of acute umbilical cord compression. When repetitive variables occur on the strip, the cause often becomes apparent at delivery when the umbilical cord is wrapped around a body part, such as the neck or foot. At other times, the cause of compression is oligohydramnios, decreased amount of amniotic fluid, or results from a hidden cord prolapse. It's important to note that the cord compression is not continuous when variable decelerations are occurring. The compressions occurs when the uterus contracts and squeezes the cord against the fetus. It's relieved when the uterus relaxes between contractions and when compression is continuous, prolonged decelerations or bradycardia occur. During this time, we want to assist the woman to change positions and find something that's a little bit more comfortable for her that relieves the compression. If the variables stop after the position change, you'll know that the compression has been relieved. However, if they continue, try a variety of position changes, including the left lateral or knee to chest position. The most ominous type of non-reassuring periodic change is a pattern of late decelerations. These decelerations appear smooth and U-shaped on the EFM tracing, like early decelerations, but unlike early decelerations, they begin late in the contraction and recover after the contraction has ended. Late decelerations are often associated with uteral placental insufficiency, which means it's diminished or deficient blood flow to the uterus and placenta. This pattern occurs from chronic interruption of the blood supply to the placenta. It's a grave situation because the placenta is the fetus's sole source of oxygen. Interventions are aimed at improving blood flow to the placenta. Some maternal conditions such as hypoxemia, decreased cardiac output, or hypotension can also affect the oxygen supply to the fetus. Something, some nursing interventions that we can do is um, position the woman on the right or her left side to relieve compression of the maternal abdominal aorta and inferior vena cava, which in turn improves blood flow to the placenta. We also want to discontinue the infusion of oxytoxics, uh, apply oxygen via mask um, with 10 to, two, 10 to 12 liters per minute, and immediately notify the doctor. Early decelerations are benign periodic changes. True, sometimes instead of accelerations, there's a slowing of the FHR. If the dip in the FHR tracing occurs in conjunction with and mirrors a uterine contraction, it's considered early deceleration. As long as the baseline remains within normal limits and the variability is good, early decelerations are benign. As you can see in these pictures, early D cells mirror each other. So the fetal heart rate as well as the mom. So the fetal heart rate is up in the top and the mom's contractions are in the bottom. So the early decelerations, they mirror each other. Whereas the variable ones, the baby's heart rate it's kind of everywhere in response to the mom's contraction. It's also V-shaped, whereas the late decelerations, you can tell that it happens after it dips after the mom's contractions. So because a non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern may not necessarily reflect a compromised fetus, there are different ways to determine fetal status, such as fetal stimulation, fetal scalp sampling, and fetal scalp pulse oximetry. So with fetal stimulation, to see if a fetus is responsive, the nurse or the doctor may elect to try fetal stimulation. So for this procedure, the fetus is stimulated indirectly with an acoustic vibrator through the abdominal wall or is stimulated directly on the scalp by the gloved fingers of the examiner's hand during a vaginal examination. Now, if the fetus responds by accelerating the heart rate, fetal acidosis is not present. If the fetal heart rate accelerations do not occur after stimulation, fetal acidosis is a strong possibility. Fetal scalp sampling is a technique for checking the fetal pH. So for this, the doctor places a lighted endoscope into the vagina through the dilated cervix and holds it on the fetal scalp. The doctor then cleans the scalp with a special cotton swab, makes a tiny cut, kind of like a finger stick, 
and collects a small amount of blood in a long heparinized capillary tube. It's then tested to determine the pH. So fetal pH is within the normal range of 7.25 or more is reassuring. However, if the pH is abnormally low, like 7.15 or lower, the fetus almost certainly has acidosis. Fetal acidosis indicates that the fetus is truly in distress and needs to be delivered quickly. Even though the risk is low, there can still be complications from the fetal scalp sampling. So they, the fetus may get an infection, fetal and maternal blood may intermingle, there might be blood incompatibilities, fetus can experience anemia. So because fetal scalp sampling has many drawbacks, there's something called fetal scalp pulse oximetry, which is also used to monitor fetal oxygenation. This uses the same principles of pulse oximetry as those used to measure oxygen saturation in adult clients, but in this instance, the sensor is inserted into the uterus and placed next to the fetal che cheek or temple to detect fetal oxygen saturation levels. In this way, the nurse can make a better decision about fetal status than with the electronic fetal monitoring alone. So as we know, the first stage begins with the onset of labor and ends when the cervix is dilated and 100% effaced. Our role during this stage of labor focuses on assessment, providing physical care to the mother and the fetus, and providing psychological care to the mother as well as keeping the doctor informed about the labor progress. During this phase, we want to observe fetal and labor status at least once every hour because contractions during early labor are typically 5 to 10 minutes apart and last 30 to 45 seconds and are of mild intensity. It is also important that we need to observe her psychosocial state so she might be talkative and express feelings of confidence and excitement during this phase, but in turn, she, al she may also be fear for fearful, particularly if she feels unprepared for the event and she experiences anticipatory anxiety. We want to be able to monitor the maternal vital signs, her hydration status, provide any comforts like regulating the temperature or softening the lighting or position changes. Uh, we also want to help with maternal coping, such as talking, reinforcing breathing techniques, uh, encouraging rituals. We also want to provide supportive care to the woman and her partner. So maybe provide them privacy, uh, keep the woman and her partner informed, be aware of the noise and conversation. We want to monitor the fetal heart rate, monitor the uterine contraction, each time the fetal heart rate is assessed, monitor the status of the membranes, and assist with any vaginal examination. So a way that we can relieve the anxiety of a woman that's in labor is to encourage the woman to verbalize her fears and uncertainties. It may be helpful to ask what concerns her most about the labor. Often anxiety decreases when the woman verbalizes her fears. When the source of anxiety is determined, implement measures to decrease the anxiety based on the cause. For example, if the woman is unsure she will be able to withstand the pain of labor, a discussion of pain relief options may be helpful. If she doesn't know what to expect, she may benefit from a brief explanation of the normal process of labor. You also maybe want to encourage distraction techniques, uh, engaging in conversation, watching TV or shopping are examples of diversionary activities that may be helpful during the latent phase of labor. Food and beverage intake during labor is a subject of debate. Question number three. When planning care for a client in the latent phase of labor, what is one primary goal? D. Mother is safe. So maintaining the safety of the laboring woman and her fetus throughout the latent phase of the first stage of labor are primary goals when planning care. We have to remember that contractions become a lot more frequent and stronger during active labor. During active labor, the woman may become more introverted, restless, or anxious. 
and she might feel a little bit more helpless and fear is losing control. So distraction techniques may fail to promote the coping. Being that the contractions are going to become more frequent and stronger, we have to make sure that she has an adequate relaxation period because this allows for sufficient blood flow to the placenta and promote oxygenation of the fetus. We also want to observe and document fetal status at least every 30 minutes. We want to make sure that we're observing maternal status at the same frequency as the fetal status. We also want to make sure that we are providing pain management, pr promoting effective breathing patterns, preventing infection, and overall just being supportive. So being that the transition phase is the most intense phase of labor, we know that the woman's going to become more irritable and less cooperative. We're going to look for an increase in bloody show and a strong urge to push. She's going to become, she might tremble, she might vomit, she might cry, but we also have to observe for hyperventilation during this phase. We want to make sure that we are managing her pain. Reassure the woman that this phase of labor is the most intense, but usually the shortest and continue to assist the woman's labor partner in providing comfort and support during uterine contractions. We also want to accept any behavioral changes of the laboring woman because we don't want to be forceful during this period of labor. You're going to need to provide intensive psychological support for both the woman and her support person. Remind them that this is the shortest phase of labor and these behavioral changes are normal. We're going to want to make sure that we are supporting the woman through her fatigue, relaxing and or using coping mechanisms during contractions may be almost impossible for some women, and fatigue is common during this phase of labor. Encourage the woman to relax or even sleep between contractions. Your client is in the transition phase of labor. One of your nursing interventions will be supporting the woman's coach through the woman's fatigue. False. Relaxing with the contractions may be almost impossible. Assist the woman to achieve relaxation or even sleep between contractions. Help her to find a comfortable position. Support her position with pillows. Place a cool cloth to her forehead or give her a back rub may help her relax between contractions. So the second stage of labor begins when the cervix is 10 centimeters dilated and is 100% effaced and ends with the birth of the newborn. Nursing care during this stage of labor focuses on providing physical and psychological support of the woman while she pushes the fetus through the birth canal. Observation of maternal and fetal well-being during this stage is crucial. During this stage, we're wanting to make sure that we are assessing the woman and her fetus. So we want to monitor her PP, her pulse, her respiration, and observe the contraction pattern. Now, ob observation of the fetus during the second stage is absolutely essential. As the fetus descends into the pelvis, the pressure on his head is very intense. There may also be pressure on the umbilical cord during contraction. Frequently, the fetal monitor strip reveals early or variable deceleration. Variables are usually not ominous at this stage as long as the fetal heart rate returns quickly to baseline as the contraction relaxes. The baseline remains between 110 and 160 and variability is present. You want to make sure we're checking the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes for the low risk woman and every 5 minutes for the woman who is at risk for labor complications. All of the comfort measures that we use during the first stage of labor we're also going to be using for the second stage of labor, such as applying the cold cloth to the forehead or offering ice chips or promoting relaxation between contractions. Once the cervix is fully dilated, the woman can begin pushing efforts. Traditionally, OB nurses have taught women to use vigorous pushing techniques. When vigorous pushing, also called valsalva pushing, is used the woman is told 
to take a deep breath, hold the breath, and push while counting to 10. She's encouraged to complete three good pushes in this manner with each contraction. This form of pushing, however, may increase the rate of maternal fatigue during the second stage of labor and hasn't been shown to be more effective form of pushing as compared to the open glottis or urged to push methods of pushing. The two forms of pushing currently suggested for the woman in labor are open glottis pushing and the urged to push method. Open glottis pushing is characterized by pushing when contractions using an open glottis so that the air is released during the pushing effort. You may also encourage the woman to use the urge to push method in which the woman bears down only when she feels the urge to do so. No matter what pushing technique is used, never leave the woman alone during pushing efforts. The third stage of labor begins with the birth of the newborn and ends with the delivery of the placenta. During this stage of labor, nursing care focuses on monitoring the placental separation and provides physical and psychological care to the woman. The new mother often experiences a sense of relief that the birth has been accomplished and contractions have ceased. We want to monitor for signs of placental separation, which generally occurs within 5 to 20 minutes of delivery. These signs begin with a uterine contraction and then the fundus rises in the abdomen. The uterus will take on a globular shape and blood will begin to trickle steadily from the vagina and the umbilical cord lengthens as the placenta separates from the uterine wall. The placenta may deliver in one of two ways. So the most common way is for the smooth, shiny fetal side to deliver first, which is the Schultz mechanism, and then sometimes the edge of the placenta appears at the introitus revealing the rough maternal surface, which is called the Duncan mechanism. The latter mechanism of delivery is more frequently associated with retained placental fragments. After the placenta delivers, the nurse inspects it for its completeness. We want to palpate the fundus to make sure the uterus is firm and contracted and monitor the perineum for excessive bleeding. So in this phase, we want to make sure that we are monitoring the woman's vital signs as well as making sure we're preventing any fluid loss. We want to make sure that tachycardia and a failing BP are signs of impeding shock, so we want to make sure that we monitor for these. Uh, we also want to monitor for any sudden change in status, such as shortness of breath, chest pain, tachypnea, because this can all indicate development of amniotic fluid embolism. In the fourth phase, this is the recovery phase. It begins with the delivery of the placenta and ends with the woman's physical condition has stabilized. Nursing care during this stage focuses on a continued assessment and care of the woman and promoting parental newborn bonding. The new mother is at highest risk for hemorrhage during the first two to four hours of the postpartum period. The woman's vital signs and a fundal check should be done every 15 minutes. To do a fundal check, palpate the fundus for position and firmness. The fundus should be well contracted at the midline and approximately one finger breadth below the umbilicus immediately after delivery. We also want to observe the lochia, which is the vaginal discharge after birth, for color and quantity. The lochia should be dark red and of a small to moderate amount. If the woman saturates more than one perennial pad in an hour, palpate and massage the fundus and notify the nurse. We also wanted to monitor for signs of infection. Um, their temperature may be slightly elevated as high as 100.4 because of dehydration and stress from the delivery, but anything above that should also be reported. The woman should void within six hours after delivery because the trauma from the birth may have caused edema in the perineal area or the anesthesia may be persistent. We want to monitor the woman's comfort level, her psychosocial state, and be careful regarding the immediate time after delivery. So I don't think I need to tell anyone that labor pain is different than any other type of pain.
pain is individual. It's subjective. It's a sensory experience. A complex interplay of physiological, psychological, emotional, environmental, and sociocultural factors that all influence the way a person perceives and responds to pain. Now, a woman's response to labor pain is influenced by all of these factors, including her expectations about labor and her confidence in her ability to cope with labor. Additionally, any previous experience with pain, birth, and any coping strategies that she's utilized in the past will also influence her response to labor pain with this work. In most instances, pain is a warning sign of injury, but labor pain is associated with a normal physiologic process. In other types of pain, greater intensity is often associated with greater injury. During labor, intensity increases as the woman approaches birth, which is the desirable and positive outcome. Although the pain of labor often begins without warning, once labor is established, it occurs in a predictable pattern with respite from pain between contractions. This characteristic is different from most other types of pain because it's predictable and the woman can prepare for and better cope with the pain. The pain of labor and birth is unique to the woman given birth. It is a multi-dimensional experience consisting of many factors. What is one of those factors? C. The woman's culture. Many factors influence the pain of labor and birth, making it a multi-dimensional experience. Examples of a psychosocial influences include the level of the woman's fear and anxiety, her culture, and the circumstances surrounding the birth experience, such as whether the pregnancy is planned or unplanned, the child is wanted or unwanted, the birth is preterm or term, and the fetus is living or dead. There is no one perfect way to control labor pain. Each woman responds to the experience uniquely. Pain management during labor should be planned and implemented, keeping several principles in mind. These principles include interventions, safety, and involvement of the woman in her pain relief. The specific techniques used to manage pain can be divided into two major categories, non-pharmacological interventions and pharmacological interventions. Most commonly, a woman uses a combination of techniques to cope with labor. She may need assistance coping before medication is used or in conjunction with medication. Safety considerations for the woman and her fetus are an important part of the nursing care for both categories. Women identify being involved in their pain management and adequate control of their pain as important factors in their overall labor experience. Inform the woman of pain management options and be supportive of the choices that she makes. Remember that the woman has the right to change her mind about the acceptability of any particular pain management technique at any time before or during labor. Rarely is there a completely pain-free labor. Even when a woman plans for an epidural, she frequently reports pain before the epidural is administered. Caregivers may underrate the severity of pain when compared with a woman's ratings. It's important to accept that the woman's description of the severity of the pain, even when she may not appear to be in any pain. Women often report that it is not the amount of pain they have during the labor that contributes to a satisfactory birth experience, but rather how their pain was managed. Ideally, the woman discusses labor pain management with her doctor during the pregnancy and attends prenatal classes. The woman who enters labor with realistic expectations usually copes well and reports a more satisfying labor experience than does a woman who is not as well prepared. If the woman is not prepared, teach the woman what to expect and assist her in coping with what she presents in labor. Keep in mind that a woman's cultural influences the way that she responds to pain. Some women are really vocal. They may cry, they may moan, and some women may display a very stoic response to pain. They may be quiet or appear to be resting. Caregivers frequently underestimate the pain of both types of women. The woman who is vocal may be labeled a quote-unquote difficult client who does not handle pain well. The stoic woman may be labeled a quote-unquote good client However, neither woman is likely to get the pain control that she needs 
unless the nurse does a careful pain assessment. Almost every woman uses some type of non-pharmacological pain intervention during labor, even when pharmacological methods are used. There are numerous methods of non-pharmacological pain relief. Some interventions are evidence-based. Other interventions need more research to demonstrate efficacy. In general, the intervention that works for the woman is frequently the best one to use. Typically, a woman needs a variety of interventions throughout labor, as labor becomes more intense, the, la the woman may need to switch to a different method of coping. For example, effleurage and distraction are often helpful in early labor, but not quite as effective in active labor and transition. Continuous labor support or with a trained nurse or a doula has been shown to be effective in increasing the coping ability of the laboring woman. Additional benefits include fewer requests for pain medication, fewer obstetric interventions, and a lower rate of cesarean delivery. Women don't experience the same benefit when nurses provide intermittent labor support as is typical for busy labor and delivery settings. Prenatally, the woman can be given information on local doula services, particularly if the woman desires childbirth with minimal medical intervention. So the advantages tend to be low technological, high touch intervention, and addresses the emotional and spiritual aspects of labor and birth, where but the disadvantage is that most busy labor and delivery hospital settings cannot provide this level of support for the laboring woman, so the woman must usually hire a doula if she desires this level of support. They are very highly effective throughout labor and may increase the woman's perception of personal control, a factor that co correlates with higher satisfaction with the labor experience. There are also comfort measures. The need for comfort measures during labor should not be underestimated. Mouth breathing during labor can lead to a dry mouth. Lip balm can help keep the lips hydrated during labor, whereas ice chips, lollipops, and clear liquids can be helpful to moisten the mouth. We want to also change linen soiled with perspiration or body fluids. Uh, a lot of facilities will have the pads to place under the buttocks to catch bloody show and amniotic fluid during labor. We can do pattern breathing, which can be very effective when the woman has practiced before labor and has an attentive labor coach. Uh, the advantages are that they don't require any special tools. It promotes relaxation. Basic patterns can be taught by the nurse when the woman presents in labor. Also, but the disadvantages is that it requires training and practice before labor to be more effective. Relaxation is the objective of almost every non-pharmacological intervention. When the woman becomes anxious or apprehensive, she tenses her muscles. This action can slow the labor process and decrease the amount of oxygen reaching the uterus and the fetus. So when the woman maintains a state of relaxation during and between contractions, she's actually working with her body to facilitate facilitate the labor process. The following discussion highlights several techniques that may help relax during labor. So let's talk about effleurage. Effleurage can be really helpful during early labor to decrease the sensation of pain. It's something that's easy to learn and simple to perform and doesn't require any special tools, but the disadvantage is that it's less effective during active labor as the contractions become more intense and the fetal monitor straps on the abdomen may interfere with a woman's ability to use this technique. Uh, we can also do water therapy, which is highly effective pr to promote relaxation and decrease the sensation of pain, especially during the first hour or two. Um, many women will find that water is very comforting during labor, but the disadvantage is that it requires availability of a tub which isn't necessarily always available in a hospital setting. It can also slow labor if used too early, and the woman may notice decreased effectiveness over time. Uh, there's also things like imagery, hypnosis, intradermal water injections, acupressure, and acupuncture. There's currently no perfect method to relieve the pain of labor. 
The ideal pharmacological method would provide excellent pain relief and still allow the woman to freely change positions, ambulate, and not impair the woman's cognitive state. Additionally, the ideal method would not cross the placenta and will not have potentially severe side effects on the fetus. But one of the reasons that women began, began to choose a hospital as a place to deliver their infant was for the pharmacological pain relief methods that were available. This began in the 1960s to 1970s. They felt that this was the best way to experience their labor and the birth. Now, it's important to understand that there's a difference between analgesia and anesthesia, although the terms are sometimes used interchangeably. Analgesia is the use of medication to reduce the sensation of pain. Anesthesia is the use of medication to partially or totally block all sensation to an area of the body. Anesthesia may or may not involve loss of consciousness. Now, Analgesia is you is correlates with sedation. So sedation is a state of reduced anxiety or stress, and sedatives promote sedation and relaxation. However, they don't provide pain relief. So barbiturates such as secobarbital and pentobarbital may be given in early labor to promote sleep, but we have to keep in mind that they can cause respiratory and central nervous system depression in the newborn if given within 12 to 24 hours of birth. There's also opioids, such as also known as narcotic analgesics, which have opium-like properties and are the most frequently administered medication to provide analgesia during labor. They're most commonly given by the IV route because it's the fastest onset and provides the most consistent drug levels than do the sub-Q or the IM routes. Now, Opioids such as Demerol, fentanyl, and morphine are frequently ordered to assist the laboring woman to better, better tolerate labor pain, but each medication has its drawbacks. So yes, these include short duration of pain relief, potential for maternal and or neonatal sedation, and potential drug interactions. The laboring woman must be observed for any side effects, including over sedation and inadequate ventilation. It's important to note that opioids cross the placenta and remain in the fetal circulatory system, which can cause changes in the fetal heart pattern. This can also cause side effects in the infant right after delivery, including respiratory depression. So with anesthesia, there's three basic types of anesthesia. There's local, regional, and general. Local anesthesia is used to numb the perineum just before birth to allow for episiotomy and repair. The regional anesthesia can also provide excellent pain relief during labor and birth and is the preferred type of anesthesia for non-emergent cesarean births, but general anesthesia is reserved for emergencies in which the baby must be delivered immediately to save the life of the baby, mother, or both. So regional anesthesia involves blocking a group of sensory nerves that supply a particular organ or area of the body. Local anesthetics and opioids are given to induce regional anesthesia or analgesia. Now, the types of regional anesthetics that may be used during the labor are pudendal block, epidural anesthesia, and combined epidural spinal anesthesia and spinal block. Any time that an anesthetic is administered using any of the techniques described, there's a chance that the local anesthetic agent will inadvertently enter the bloodstream and cause a toxic reaction in the woman. Fortunately, this situation rarely occurs, but we have to be prepared to perform CPR if needed. So the pudendal block. A pudendal block is given just before the baby is born to provide pain relief for the birth. The doctor will inject a local anesthetic bilaterally into the vaginal wall to block pain sensations to the pudendal nerve. Now, this can be helpful for instrument-assisted deliveries and for repair of an episiotomy or a perennial tear. If an incomplete block occurs, the doctor provider may have to inject additional local anesthesia for episiotomy repair. Now, this method isn't effective to relieve the pain of labor. So, epidural anesthesia for the management of labor has become increasingly popular, especially in the U.S., because it provides excellent pain relief, 
often completely blocking pain sensation. What they'll do is they'll place a small catheter into the epidural space and then they inject the catheter with local anesthetics or opioids to provide pain relief. Sometimes a one-time dose of medication is placed into the spinal fluid, which is called an intrathecal injection in conduction with epidural anesthesia. Now the advantage of that is that the intrathecal dose is effective almost immediately and provides pain relief until the epidural begins to work. Although its use is popular, it's not without risk. There's significant risk of maternal hypotension that often requires treatment with vasopressors. Because a woman receives epidural anesthesia, an IV line, IV line must also be in place. A 500 to 2000 ml IV fluid bolus is given before the epidural is started to reduce the risk of hypotension. And because it's an invasive procedure, informed consent is required. We also have the intrathecal anesthesia, which is also known as the spinal block, which is similar to epidural anesthesia. The main difference is the location of the anesthetic. So instead of injecting local anesthesia and or opioids into the epidural space, these medications are placed in the subarachnoid space into the spinal fluid. This type of anesthesia is used most frequently for planned cesarean deliveries. The disadvantage is Using a spinal block during labor is that the anesthetic might wear off while the woman is still in labor. So some complications that are associated with epidural and intrathecal anesthesia is hypotension. It tends to be the most frequent side effect associated with epidural or intrathecal anesthesia. Other symptoms associated with this can be lightheadedness, nausea, fetal bradycardia, and also paralysis of the woman's respiratory muscles. A woman can also experience spinal headaches, which although they occur rarely because of the advanced techniques and smaller needle sizes that we've used, a spinal headache is suspected when the woman has an intense headache in the upright position and that's relieved only when she lies down and is still. Without treatment, the spinal headache resolves in 7 to 10 days and symptomatic treatment of oral analgesics and caffeine can give temporary relief. Uh, when narcotics are used in addition to anesthetics, pruritus can be a common side effect. Most women tolerate the itching, particularly because the pain relief is generally excellent for the first 24 hours, but we can also provide Narcan or Benadryl for this. We also have to keep in mind that respiratory depression can also be a possible side effect uh, when narcotics are used for spinal and or epidural anesthesia. So for this reason alone, we need to have Narcan on the side just in case for respiratory depression. General anesthesia is not used frequently in obstetrics because of the risks involved. The pregnant woman is at higher risk for aspiration and it requires a, more skill to intubate a pregnant woman because of physiological changes in the trachea and the thorax. Also, general anesthetic agents cross the placenta and can result in the birth of a severely depressed neonate who requires full resuscitation. Because of these risks, General anesthesia is only used in emergent cases where delivery of the fetus must be done quickly. When it has to be used, usually they order preoperative medications to reduce the risk of harm should aspiration occur. Malignant hyperthermia is a rare but potentially life-threatening complication of general anesthesia. It's an inherited condition that causes sustained muscle contractions in the presence of certain anesthetic agents. So for this reason, a thorough history is important before general anesthesia is given. Ideally, a pregnant woman with a family history of malignant hyperthermia is identified in the prenatal period so that the healthcare team can be prepared to pre care for this woman if general anesthesia becomes necessary. In this case, Epidural anesthesia during labor is the best for this woman. This practice allows for safe anesthesia if a C-section is required.
the signs and symptoms that we have to watch out for for malignant hyperthermia is severe muscle rigidity, tachycardia, irregular heart rhythm, decreased oxygen saturation, and cyanosis. Body temperature can rapidly increase to lethal levels. However, this may be a late sign. Dantrolene sodium given intravenously is the drug of choice to treat malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is a potential complication of general anesthesia that has genetic origins. Truth.
So we have mechanical methods um, to ripen the cervix. So one of the most common mechanical methods used to hasten cervical readiness is called membrane stripping. The doctor inserts a gloved finger through the internal cervical os and sweeps the finger 360 degrees to separate the membrane from the lower uterine segment. Plasma levels of prostaglandins are measurably higher after membrane stripping. Another mechanical method includes dilation of the cervix by the doctor using a catheter. The tip of the catheter is inserted through the cervix and the balloon of the catheter is filled with 30 to 80 mLs of sterile saline. The inflated balloon rests between the internal cervical os and the amniotic sac. Laminaria, as you can see in the bottom picture on the right hand side, or cervical dilators are sometimes used to soften and dilate the cervix. Laminaria is made from the root of seaweed and there are two synthetic products that we use, Dilapan and Lanocell. The one that you see on the picture on the bottom is Laminaria. The healthcare provider will pro place the material in the cervix and then after being in there, it expands as it absorbs moisture and dilates the cervix gradually. It's usually removed in six to eight hours, whereas Laminaria stays in for 12 to 24. The most common conditions for which cervix dilators are used to induce an abortion, either therapeutic or elective, or to induce labor when the fetus has died in utero. Pharmacological methods can also be used to effectively prepare an unripe labor, uh, unripe cervix for labor. These agents used are called prostaglandin and they're applied locally to the cervix. So the only substance approved by the FDA for this purpose is prostaglandin E2 or vaginal insert. Um, although prostaglandin E1 is used frequently for cervical ripening, it is not approved by the FDA for this purpose. So prostaglandin E2 is available in two forms, in a gel and a vaginal insert. The gel is called Prepadil and the vaginal insert is called Cervidil. The doctor inserts the Prepadil into the cervix, whereas Cervidil is a time-release insert that's placed on the posterior fornix of the vagina during a vaginal examination. For the insert, it stays in place until spontaneous labor ensues, or at least for 12 hours. So one advantage of Cervidil, which is the vaginal insert, is that it can be removed if uterine hyperstimulation occurs by pulling on the string that's attached to the insert, kind of like a tampon. The woman receiving prostaglandins should be in a facility that has continuous fetal monitoring capabilities. The nurse will check the fetal heart rate at least 20 minutes and uterine activity should be documented before the prostaglandins are administered. Generally, the prostaglandin is usually administered in the evening, and sometimes the woman's even allowed to go home and return when the labor ensues. The prostaglandin E2 is contraindicated in women who have had a previous cesarean birth or have had a uterine surgery, such as fibroid removal, because of the increased risk of uterine rupture. So for prostaglandin E1, which is the one that wasn't approved by FDA, but that doctors use uh, frequently for cervical ripening. It's actually used uh, for to treat gastric ulcers that are caused by NSAID use. Um, it's either administered orally or vaginally to ripen the cervix. When given the oral route, it causes less uterine hyperstimulation than via the vaginal route. So. Artificial rupture of membranes is also known as an amniotomy, which can be done to induce labor or to augment labor that has already begun. So the doctor essentially introduces a hard plastic instrument with a hook on the end. It's called an amnio hook. It goes into the vagina during a digital examination, and then he, the doctor guides the instrument through the cervix and uses the hook to create a hole in the membrane. At this point, amniotic fluid is usually expelled. This process causes the body to release prostaglandin, which enhances labor. So nursing care it generally is just noting and documenting the color and the amount of amniotic fluid and monitoring the fetal heart rate. 
oxytocin induction is a synthetic form of the posterior pituitary hormone that causes the uterus to contract. It's the most common agent used for labor induction. Before we administer anything like this, we have to get at least 20 minutes of fetal monitoring for a baseline fetal heart assessment and then also start a main a mainline IV line before administering and connecting the oxytocin medication. But there are several potential complications that are associated with the use of oxytocin for inducing labor. When it's induced, compared to the woman going into spontaneous labor, the risk for a cesarean birth increases. There's also a risk that the uterus will be hyperstimulated, and hyperstimulation leads to contractions that occur one after the other without a sufficient rest period in between. This can lead to, fe this can lead to fetal distress and even uterine rupture. The fetal distress is due to a decrease in blood flow through the placenta, causing a decrease in the amount of oxygen that the fetus receives. Another potential complication is water retention. Symptoms of water retention include hyponatremia, confusion, convulsions, or coma, and congestive heart failure and death can also occur. Our role during this time is comfort care, including changing linens and supporting the laboring woman, uh, which are a very important invention, interventions also performed by the LVN. However, the LVN, as the LVN, you may be asked to assist the doctor during a pelvic exam in which mechanical methods of cervical ripening are used. An episiotomy is a surgical incision made into the perineum to enlarge the vaginal opening just before the baby is born. Complications from an episiotomy include bleeding, hematoma, infection, and an extension of the episiotomy into the anal sphincter. Some methods that we can use to minimize the need for an episiotomy is prenatal perineal massage, using natural pushing techniques, particularly in the sideline position of birth attendants, patients with the delivery process, warm compresses to the perineum during second stage of labor, and delivering the fetal head between contractions. There are some appropriate situations that a episiotomy is appropriate. This includes the baby shoulders are stuck in the birth canal after the head is born, which is called shoulder dyscosias. Um, the head will not rotate from an occiput posterior position, which is persistent occiput posterior, or the fetus is in a breech presentation or the instruments are being used to shorten the second stage of labor, such as forceps or a vacuum. So there are two different types of episiotomy. A median or a midline episiotomy uh, extends from the porchette, which is the point where the labia minora joins the perineum, straight down into the true perineum. This type of episiotomy increases the risk for extension into the anal sphincter, but is easier for the physician to repair than a medial lateral episiotomy, which angles to the right or left of the perineum. The perineum requires repair after an episiotomy, and if the woman has had epidural anesthesia, she may not need additional anesthesia for repair. Frequently, the nurse uses local anesthesia to numb the perineum for repair. The nurse should have sutures and other supplies ready just in case. An episiotomy is a surgical incision made in the perineum of a laboring woman to assist in the passage of the fetus at birth. What is a possible maternal complication of an episiotomy? B. Anemia. The woman is at higher risk to have episiotomy and for extension of episiotomy into the anal sphincter with operative vaginal delivery. Other maternal complications include uterine rupture, perennial pain, lacerations, and hematomas, urinary retention, anemia, and rehospitalization. Another procedure sometimes used to assist the delivery is the vacuum extraction, in which the doctor places the suction cup, usually a soft silicone cup, on the fetal head and applies suction. The doctor then uses the device to gently guide the delivery of the fetal head. 
The nurse is responsible for providing the necessary equipment, connecting and regulating the suction as instructed by the doctor, monitoring fetal status and supporting the laboring woman during the procedure by keeping her informed of the procedure and progress. Vacuum assisted delivery is not without risk. Serious neonatal complications such as scalp bruising or lacerations, cephalohematoma, subglageal and intracranial hemorrhage, and even death can occur. The risk increases with the amount of pressure used, the number of times a suction cup suddenly loses suction and commonly called a pop-off, and the total amount of time the suction is used. After the delivery, we have to make sure that we are monitoring the fetus for complications postpartum and also monitor the mother for pain, excess blood loss, hematoma, urinary retention due to edema, and infection. In a forceps assisted delivery, forceps are metal instruments with curved blunted blades, kind of like hollowed out spoons that are placed around the head of a fetus by the doctor to facilitate delivery. Low and outlet forceps are most common than mid forceps. Outlet forceps are applied when the fetal head can be seen at the introitus. Low forceps are used when the station is equal to or greater than a plus two, but the head is not yet showing on the perineum. Mid forceps are used when the fetal head is well engaged, but still relatively high in the pelvis, which is higher than a two. Mid forceps are often used to assist the fetus in rotating to an anterior position. There are associated risks such as neonatal, cephalohematoma, retinal, subdural, and sublegeal hemorrhage, which occur more frequently with vacuum extraction than with forceps. Facial bruising, facial nerve injury, skull fractures, and seizures are more common with forceps. The woman is at higher risk to have an episiotomy for extension of episiotomy into the anal sphincter with operative vaginal delivery with forceps. Other maternal complications include uterine rupture, perennial pain, lacerations, hematoma, urinary retention, anemia, and rehospitalization. A cesarean birth is the delivery of a fetus through incisions made into both abdomen and the uterus. Sometimes we may call it cesarean section, but cesarean section, cesarean birth, and cesarean delivery are all essentially the same. There are many indications for cesarean birth. Some of the more common reasons for a cesarean birth include history of a previous cesarean, labor dystocia, which is failure to progress in labor, non-reassuring fetal status, and fetal mouth presentation, such as a breech presentation. Some other less common indications might be placenta previa, which means the placenta covers the cervix, abruptio placentae, which means the placenta separates from the uterus before birth, or cephalopelvic disproportion, which is the fetal head cannot fit through the pelvis, or active vaginal herpes lesions, prolapse of the umbilical cord, and a ruptured uterus. Sometimes medical and obstetric conditions necessitate premature delivery of the fetus and require cesarean delivery. Examples include maternal diabetes mellitus, preeclampsia, erythroblastosis fatalis, and for some fetal malformations such as spina bifida. We have to remember that a cesarean birth is a major surgery and carries with it all the risks associated with surgery combined with the risk of birth itself. A woman who delivers by cesarean is at risk for anesthesia-related complications, infection, and thromboembolic and wound complications. The normal physiological changes of pregnancy increase some surgical risk factors. For example, thrombophlebitis is a complication of both surgery and pregnancy, so the risk is a lot higher with cesarean delivery than vaginal delivery. There are risks to the fetus as well. Inadvertent delivery of a premature fetus is one cesarean risk factor. In addition, a cesarean birth increases the incidence of a transient tachypnea of the newborn, a type of respiratory distress due to the fetal lung fluid not being expressed from vaginal compression during delivery. 
For those reasons, cesarean delivery should be performed only when the risks of vaginal delivery clearly outweigh the risks of surgery. Because of the higher morbidity and mortality rates associated with cesarean delivery versus vaginal delivery, it is a national goal to decrease the cesarean delivery rate. Some of the complications that can occur during the operation include laceration of the uterine artery, bladder, ureter, bowel, hemorrhage requiring blood transfusion, and hysterectomy. The most common post-op complication associated with a C-section is infection. Two common infection sites are the uterus and the surgical wound. And although sepsis, urinary tract infections, and other infections can occur. Pneumonia, postpartum hemorrhage, thrombophlebitis, and other surgical-related complications, such as wound dehiscence, can occur during the post-op period as well. The two most common fetal complications are unintended delivery of an immature fetus because of miscalculation of dates and respiratory distress because of retained lung fluid. Because a fetus delivered by scheduled C-section does not go through labor, he does not have the chance to get most of the amniotic fluid squeezed out of his lungs, as does a baby born vaginally. Therefore, respiratory distress happens more frequently in these newborns. In addition, the general anesthesia given to the woman who depresses the fetus respiratory drive makes it difficult for the newborn to take his or her first breath. Less commonly, a fetal injury can occur, such as a scalpel cutting through the uterine wall and nicking the baby, causing a small laceration. Usually, these wounds are superficial and require minimal intervention. So, to do a cesarean birth, you can do two different incision types. One through the abdominal wall and the, the other one through the uterus. So, if you're going to do an abdominal incision, it's called a laparotomy. And for cesarean birth, it can be either vertical or low transverse. So vertical abdominal incisions are located in the midline of the lower abdomen and a lower transverse incision is commonly known as a bikini cut, although a low transverse incision slightly increases the risk for bleeding. This is usually the preferred method for cosmetic reasons. The uterine incision is termed a hysterotomy and can be either vertical or low transverse. There are two types of vertical uterine incisions, which is classical and low cervical. The classical incision extends through the body of the uterus to the fundus, and this incision is used only in severe emergencies, when it's critical to deliver the fetus immediately or when the fetus is unusually large. Bleeding during surgery is more likely with a classic uterine incision. It carries a higher risk for abdominal infection and the highest risk for uterine rupture in subsequent pregnancies. The low cervical vertical incision is smaller and carries a lower risk for uterine rupture than does the classical approach, but it is used infrequently because it is more complicated to perform, carries higher risk of maternal injury, and is associated with a higher risk of uterine rupture than is the low cervical transverse incision. It does have the advantage of allowing for extension of the incision into the body of the uterus if the surgeon has difficulty extracting the fetus. The low cervical transverse incision is the preferred method. This incision is associated with the least risk of uterine rupture, is easier to repair, and is associated with less blood loss. A cesarean birth is major surgery and requires a team approach in caring for the pregnant woman. During the intraoperative period of a cesarean delivery, what is the role of the LVN? Act as a scrub nurse if trained appropriately. The specially trained LVN may function as a scrub nurse if a cesarean becomes necessary. In the past, there was a quote that was, once a cesarean, always a cesarean, that guided the practice of obstetrics in the U.S., and women with a pre prior cesarean birth were scheduled for repeat cesareans. We've generally tried to decrease the number of cesarean births, and we are opting instead for a vaginal birth after cesarean, which is VBAC. VBAC rates were at the highest rate 
in the late 1990s and have steadily declined since then. Currently, there is a continued debate in the medical community because of the risks associated with a vaginal birth after having a cesarean. The woman attempting a vaginal birth after a cesarean should not have had a prior cesarean for CPD. That is cephalopelvic disproportion. So if a baby's head was too large to fit through the mo mother's pelvis and they ended up going for a cesarean section, you can't have a vaginal birth after something like that. Right now, there are developed guidelines identifying factors for the healthcare provider to consider before attempting a trial of labor after cesarean. A woman needs to have adequate counseling from the doctor regarding the benefits and the risks, as well as the benefits and risks for a repeat cesarean delivery. So the greatest concern is that there's a risk for uterine rupture during vaginal birth after cesarean, which is much higher when a woman has had a classic uterine incision from previous cesarean delivery. Therefore, vaginal birth after cesarean is contraindicated when this type of scar is present. Other contraindications include any complication that disqualifies the woman for a vaginal delivery, such as placenta previa, history.